Good day. I'm Milton Schoen and welcome to America Salutes. Today we are fortunate to have Patrick Kelly, who is the mm -hmm. director. Nice of to the, see you, Milt. Nice to see you, Patrick, mm -hmm. uh, from the Minneapolis VA uh, Medical Center or Healthcare System. Uh, and before we, we get too far, why don't you just tell us a little bit about your background because you had a background in healthcare sure. in the United States Navy. Uh, first of all, thanks for inviting me back. It's good to be back on your show. So I'm, I'm a, a native of Mankato, as my hometown, and I spent uh, 29 years uh, serving in the Navy as a Medical Service Corps officer. Uh, did a lot of the same type of work that I'm doing in the VA, although as most of the sailors out there know, it's, you get a lot of variety when you serve in the Navy. So I did operational tours and headquarters tours and worked in hospitals and, and, and overseas. And so uh, uh, retired in 2011. I did a couple of years in Sioux Falls as the director, and then I've been in Minneapolis for almost three and a half years now. Very good. Yeah. Um, and there, are, the, the institution itself is transformed, and one of the things that uh, in, in the years I've been a county veteran service officer is to see the changes in addressing veterans' homelessness. And mm -hmm. I think you've got a number of uh, new things to report on that yeah. front. Well, thanks for asking. So, you know, the VA, you may remember that uh, General Shinseki, Secretary Shinseki at the time made it his number one priority for the VA to end veterans homelessness. And, you know, we, our most recent project is we're building another 100 bed low income housing uh, unit uh, referred to as Veterans East across uh, Minnehaha Avenue over there where we do our work. And so uh, uh, that will then be 240 beds across the street at, the, at what used to be the original medical center. In addition to, you know, the 58 beds that we opened with Common Bond uh, a couple of years ago now, all of which are filled, uh, uh, long waiting list, uh, very, very successful project. Uh, so we also give vouchers to veterans who are in financial need. And so over the course of uh, the last, since 2009, you know, we started out with 75 vouchers and now, and now we have 651, most of which are in the metro area. Uh, and so between vouchers, uh, uh, low-income housing, uh, partnerships with the community, and of course the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs has done a really terrific job of establishing a registry. So we can count. We know which veterans are out there that are homeless. Uh, we've reduced homelessness in veterans community about 50% since uh, 2009. Uh, so the work isn't done, but there's a lot of good work going on. And, and Veterans East, for example, you know, United Healthcare was a, was a key sponsor for that project. And so, you know, between Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, local housing authorities, the, the federal VA, uh, lots of good uh, uh, private sector partners, uh, we've made a pretty good impact on veterans homelessness in the state of Minnesota. Uh, it's never going to stop. There will always be new veterans homelessness issues to address. And it remains a very high priority for the VA. And so, uh, Again, we went from four uh, homeless staff in 2009 to 40 uh, that we have today. And so a big part of the success is you, you, you find veterans a, a place to live. That's first and foremost. And then you bring in supportive services. You know, so, the, so to the extent that they're near the hospital, uh, like the common bond housing is at Fort Snelling, or like our Veterans East is across the street, it's that much easier to work with education, compensated work therapy, and a number of other things that help veterans to be successful and, and to remain home. And, and there are several different types of housing. Now, you mentioned the HUD-VASH vouchers, and a, uh, a veteran would get a scattered site Section 8 rental voucher where they can choose where they live in the community. Mm -hmm. But attached to that is intensive case management. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, there, are, there are attempts to work on the individual's behavior going forward. Uh, and that is uh, uh, a, a very positive uh, combination yeah. of uh, both the VA healthcare system and HUD's subsidy. Yeah, I mean, we have learned uh, since we've been doing this that uh, of, of veterans who are, who are very motivated and, and trying to do everything they can to succeed uh, sometimes need additional support. And so we have a ratio. So for every 25 veterans that have a HUD-VASH voucher, we hire one case manager or social worker to work specifically with those 25 veterans. And so that's why our numbers have grown so much, along with our HUD-VASH vouchers. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's the right thing to do. These veterans have earned this. And, and uh, to the extent that uh, uh, we can help them, uh, we should help them. And, uh, and we've made a dent in it, but, but it's, uh, as I mentioned, it, it's ongoing and continuous because there will always be veterans homelessness issues that we want to address and make better. 
And, and it's not one size fits all because you've got your Veterans East and, and, uh, and the Vets and Community Housing, which is sober housing. Mm -hmm. So that's dealing with a different segment of our veterans community. Right. And you've got three different housing initiatives that you mentioned and each one is slightly different mm -hmm. yeah. uh, to serve different needs. And even over in the common bond housing over Fort Snelling, as you're aware, we have four units which are family units. So, so most of them are the old horse stables, efficiency units, uh, very nice. We, last time we talked, we were over there. Uh, but, but the four family units were the old NCO quarters. And, and again, they were revitalized and, and revamped. And uh, you know, it's, it's really great when we can offer housing to families, to veterans with families, because you know, uh, that, that's, there are many veterans who struggle uh, with family members, and to the extent that we can meet that need, um, uh, we should. And, and we're, we're, we're getting better at that, but that's still an unmet need, I think, in many cases. Right, but, yeah. you're, but the, the housing is the first piece of stability, mm -hmm. and the health care is very close by. Right. Right. And so for ongoing health care, um, those two needs are being met, and, and all the housing is relatively close to the light mm -hmm. rail, so individuals have transportation, uh, so uh, uh, they're in a much better position than they may have been previously. Right, and we, we have just recently expanded our Community Resource and Referral Center in downtown Minneapolis, and so that veterans who, again, the, the thought is that the, to the extent that we can take services to veterans where they live, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's an advantage to veterans, and it helps us to make sure that they're getting the services that they need. So we're, we're about doubling the size of our community resource and referral center downtown, again, to accommodate space for our additional staff that are managing the case workers that are helping with the HUD-VASH vouchers. And we provide a lot of support services right there at the CRRC for those veterans who find it difficult to get to the medical center. Right, and yeah. we have our staff there several times a month, yes, and, it, yep. and it's a place to connect with veterans and make sure, as you said, they get the resources they need. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I know you've had a, a, a number of new things happen uh, uh, at the hospital, mm -hmm. one of which being the new surgery center, and maybe you could say something about that. Good, thank you. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we have uh, committed to is that we want to provide as many services at the medical center and in our community-based outpatient clinics as we can. Uh, as you know, the VA has committed to care in the community as well through the CHOICE program, but, but we, uh, we have been funded for and really made an effort to do more surgeries, more outpatient services, more telehealth, as much as we can in the direct VA system in order to minimize what becomes sometimes difficult co-pay efforts and logistics efforts getting care outside of the VA. And so, on September 1st, we, we cut a ribbon on a new uh, surgery center, uh, which, and, and, and in that space, we'd, we'd gone from 11 to 28 uh, individual rooms where veterans who are getting surgery are, are, are prepared and sometimes recovered. And so, all veterans who are getting surgery at the medical center come in in the new, it's in, it's in t second floor. They come in and they get their, uh, their, their preparatory work, sometimes anesthesia, certainly counseling, prior to their surgery, and it's right next to one of our 18 operating rooms. They're then transported to the operating room, and, and many of them will come back and recover there or go to our anesthesia care, post-anesthesia care unit if, they're, if they need more care. Uh, but but it's, it's new, it's clean, it's got the latest equipment, uh, and it's allowed us to do more surgeries uh, in the medical center, which again is our goal to, to do more, more complex care, more, more surgery that we used to buy in the community. Uh, we're doing more in the medical center. And, and you, the, the building itself was built at a time when we were building 900 room right. hospitals. And there's been this ongoing transformation to make it work for this uh, system that delivers patient on a, a service on an outpatient basis yeah. and to make it much uh, more uh, consumer friendly. That, that is exactly right. So we were, our original hospital was built in 19, opened in 1988. 850 beds, and, and we now have 309, so uh, it gives you, you're, you're absolutely right. And so what we have done is converted a lot of that space to uh, expanded surgery uh, centers, to uh, outpatient clinics. Uh, and so in addition to our 13 community-based outpatient clinics, again, we, we're doing more uh, ambulatory care in our hospital. Uh, and, and that requires a lot of uh, construction or, or recurring maintenance over the years to convert what used to be old hospital wards into, uh, into outpatient areas. And so that's been a lot of the effort over the course of the last couple of years. And we're trying to sort of, to the extent that we can, move services down to the first floor to minimize the travel that our veterans are doing when they come to the medical center. 
And as you know, it's complicated sometimes if you don't get there very often. It's a little bit hard to find your way around. Uh, we have a lot of volunteers who are there to help with that, but, it, but it's still a, a major effort for veterans to get through our building to the right place. And so uh, uh, more outpatient services, more uh, near the first floor where veterans can go uh, navigate their way through easily. And a lot of those support services right there on the first floor. But yeah, it's a... It's, it's changed. A building has changed since 1988, and healthcare has changed. Yeah. And and several years ago, you uh, created a parking ramp uh, that employees can't park in during right. the daytime. It was. It tells you a little bit about the customer focus yeah. that uh, many many uh, accessible parking spaces, and it's right adjacent to yeah. the medical center, and uh, it's designed to make sure people that might have mobility problems can get in there much more easily. Yeah, it was opened uh, March 17th. I remember that because it was St. Patrick's Day of 2014. And that's 520 uh, parking spaces. And it, you're right, we call it the veterans parking lot. It's for veterans. Uh, staff park in, in lots that are uh, out from the, from the main area. Because of the you know, fair amount of turnover in there, veterans coming for their appointments, it's close. Uh, it's gonna be covered here very soon. We're gonna have a walkway there for the winters. Uh, but you have 520 spaces, and we are very thankful because we, we don't have significant parking issues on our campus. Uh, we have the light rail, we have a lot of uh, parking on the campus, and so uh, the, the parking ramp, though, solved a lot of our problems. That ex extra 520 spaces really made a difference. Yeah. Well, prevention is an, a very important aspect of what you do, and uh, we were talking earlier, and you mentioned that uh, your initiatives on vaccination. So could you tell us a little bit about what's going right, on Right, and we had a chance to talk. You know, you, you and I have both had our flu shots this year. Right. That's the right thing to do. So uh, uh, we are now mailing uh, postcards to our veterans. So most of our veterans should be receiving in the mail a postcard uh, describing the dates when we'll be having our outpatient flu uh, 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 effort. In Minneapolis, it's gonna be the 25th to the 27th. So next week, we will run three days in our flag atrium and near the auditorium where veterans can just walk in, get their flu vaccine. We have, if you're over 65, we have a lot of the high dose vaccine. For those veterans under 65, the normal uh, vaccine uh, doesn't require an appointment with your uh, physician, uh, doesn't require anything special other than if you want your flu shot, come on in and get it. We're doing the very same thing at our community-based outpatient clinics and, and the mailing will detail the dates at the community-based outpatient clinics uh, and, and as always, veterans can come in and get, uh, when they see their doctor or when they're an inpatient, we always offer the flu vaccine. Uh, but the flu season has started. I mean, we, have, we are now seeing patients who have had the, the flu, this year's flu. So it's, uh, it's, the time is now, the time is right, and, and uh, we will likely fill up our parking ramp on those days when we have our big flu uh, uh, event. But that's a plus. That's a plus. Right. We like that. And uh, vaccination is not just limited to the flu uh, because many people are susceptible to, to pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that uh, uh, because of the electronic uh, medical record, the VA has been pushing for some time to make sure that people uh, uh, got pneumonia uh, vaccination should they need it. Yeah, one, one of the things that an <clears throat> electronic health record enables us to do is we can look back many, many years into a patient's record and we can see what uh, influenza, influenza or, or other immunizations a veteran needs or what other kinds of health care. If you're turning 60 and it's time maybe to get your Zostravax vaccine, uh, if, you need a, if you need your colonoscopy, it's in your, one of those 10-year increments. Uh, so we can, we can do that, we can see it, we'll mail it out to veterans and, and alert them to that. Uh, and, and always when a veteran's an inpatient at our facility, we, we, uh, that's one of the very first things we look at is those, uh, uh, any preventive health measures that we can do while they're with us in the hospital, uh, we always do that. It's good health care. I know you've got some new surgical services uh, uh, for both uh, heart valves and your right. uh, bariatric. Uh, uh, so, so as I mentioned previously, the, you know, sort of the more that we can do in the medical center, it's better. So uh, we, we are now offering bariatric surgery. Bariatric surgery is, is something that requires our veterans to get you know, sort of an extensive workup through our uh, 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 staff, our MOVE staff that does the weight control uh, program. But for veterans who are deemed eligible for the bariatric surgery program, we now do that in the medical center, and we've done a, a large number of those. Uh, we are also doing, uh, what is uh, referred to as TAVR, which is, uh, it used to be for, when, when veterans are, are 
older, sometimes you can't tolerate either the anesthesia or the open heart surgery that it would be required to replace your aortic valve. Or so this new procedure allows us to go in, uh, you know, through the veteran's groin area with a couple of very small holes and do the procedure, uh, this valve replacement, uh, minimally invasive, uh, uh, quick recovery. Um, most of our physicians are from the University of Minnesota. Our special subspecialty surgeons are from the University of Minnesota. So we have a long-standing 70-year partnership with the University of Minnesota where we share staff, we share physicians, and, and, and really some of the best surgeons in the world come to work at our VA Medical Center. And this TAVR uh, procedure in, in hybrid ORs, in larger ORs, uh, allows us to get in the imaging, all of the things that are needed to do this, this, this type of surgery. Uh, and when we used to buy it in the community, it's about $100,000 a pop to get this done. And so we are not only doing them in our facility, we are saving money and we're doing the recovery for the veterans and the post-surgical care right there at the medical center. So, so TAVR, bariatrics, uh, we're doing some additional procedures uh, because we have additional capability to do those with our expanded ORs and, and, uh, and very, very well-qualified uh, medical staff, surgical staff. And so uh, TAVR and bariatrics are a couple of examples, but we're gonna be doing that more and more. And I would, uh, I would just note that uh, it was uh, General Omar Bradley who made the decision to have the VA enter into agreements with teaching universities, mm -hmm. University of Minnesota, Michigan, Iowa, Northwestern, all over the country, uh, the cutting edge teaching hospitals to make sure that that knowledge came to the VA. And it's been a very good partnership uh, for both universities to train physicians and also for the VA to have uh, the ability to uh, have cutting edge medicine. Yeah, well, as, as, as I think you and I have had a chance to talk about, 70% of our nation's physicians have done some training in a VA hospital. Now, you know, not all of those physicians, of course, come to work for the VA, but what it means is that when those VA, when those physicians train at the VA, you know, they, they become now familiar with veterans' health issues. They become familiar with, the, with our system, eligibility, uh, uh, care uh, availability. And so they would now go to work in, in uh, Hibbing, Minnesota. And now that they're Hibbing, they're much more familiar with veterans and veterans' health care. And so it's, it's, I really think of it as sort of an expanded network of providers, even though they don't work for us, they, they know about our veterans. And they're better able, better suited to take care of them, uh, no matter where they are. And that's, it, it, there's an, a net plus when you work together and you're not isolated yeah. operating as a separate entity. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. there, there's another thing uh, uh, that we were discussing earlier, which was the CHOICE program. And, and uh, if, I wonder if you could give us an update on, on that. Right, I'd be happy to do so. Thanks for asking. And so, you know, the CHOICE program is now uh, almost two years old. Uh, and and for, the, for the listeners who are not familiar with CHOICE, it, it is really our care in the community program that was funded by the uh, VECA law uh, and enacted in November of 2014. And, and effectively gave us additional monies to expand direct care services in our VA system and to buy care in the community with a network of providers uh, who, under certain eligibility rules, if a veteran uh, was over 40 miles from a medical center, they could get care through the CHOICE program, or if access was beyond 30 days in the medical center, they could use the CHOICE program. So, you know, it, it, it has been a rough start. And again, I want to be very honest and frank and transparent about that. I do believe that it's gotten better and 15,000 of our veterans have used the CHOICE program in one form or another. So again, we have 103,000 veterans in our system. 15,000 have used the CHOICE program in some manner. So it, it, it is being used, but sometimes the logistics are difficult. And as we stand up new programs like the CHOICE program, you know, it was new to our VA staff it was certainly new to the veterans who previously didn't have to deal with explanations of benefits and all those kinds of things that you deal with when you get care outside of the VA healthcare system. And, and it was new to those providers who now were, you know, uh, having to uh, build the VA and the VA wasn't always very, uh, wasn't always very good. Honestly, our third party administrator, not always very good at paying the bills on time. And a lot of providers chose to, to not participate in the program because it was too hard. And so, um, I have said, and I will continue to say, I, you know, I, I was uh, in the VA when we, or D DOD rather, when we stood up TRICARE in the early 90s. And, and it took about three years for people to get accustomed to the, to the program, 
the logistics, the contacts, and for the, for the DOD to really stand up their infrastructure to support a program like that. So, so I, I believe it's getting better. It is, not, uh, perfect, it is not a perfect program. It is far from a perfect program. And again, we're trying to remedy much of this by providing more services in our medical center. Uh, but choice, I believe, is getting better, and I believe it will continue to get better. And, and again, a number of veterans are using it, and the more they use it, the more they become accustomed to the logistics, and it becomes easier to use. So that's, that's what happened in TRICARE. I think that's what's happening with Veterans Choice, and so I, I think it'll get better. And it'll, it'll be an important piece, especially for people and in my county, everybody's within, mm -hmm. 30 miles, uh, within right. 40 miles of the medical center. Uh, but for people who geographically are further away from, from health care, uh, it can be a, a, a real asset to, to some of our veterans. Absolutely. Um, you're going to be having a special Veterans Day program uh, at the Minneapolis uh, VA right. Medical Center. I wonder if you could tell us. Good. Uh, uh, yeah, so on the, on the 11th, on Veterans Day, Friday the 11th, we, we, we are having our third Veterans Day program, third annual uh, Veterans Day program. It's 2.30 in the afternoon, and it's really focused on our veterans in the hospital. So uh, a few years ago, three years ago, one of our staff members uh, whose father was actually in the medical center you know, realized that, geez, you know, her dad couldn't get to an event in the community. There are many, many community events, as you know, in the metro area. Couldn't get to one of those community events, and, and there was really nothing for those veterans on Veterans Day. So she took it upon herself to stand up, uh, organize the program. This is the third year. Major General Steiner, uh, local area uh, uh, general officer, has been our guest speaker. He will be our guest speaker again this year. And it has been very, very well attended. So, so not only are veterans in the hospital, you know, their family members come in uh, and, and uh, you know, we pretty much fill our flag atrium with participants and the, the uh, Army uh, brings over their, uh, their band and, and uh, it really is a very, very nice event for veterans uh, in the hospital who otherwise can't get to one of the community events. And so uh, third year, 2.30, anybody, any of your listeners are interested in coming, they are certainly welcome to do that, but it's, uh, it's, it's always, uh, it is a very good event for our veterans. And it's very accessible to the veterans who may are, are hospitalized and may right. have mo mobility challenges. Yes, yep. Very good. Mm. Um, I, I, I know that uh, a number of your doctors have received uh, uh, recognition as being uh, some of the most influential doctors in the state of Minnesota, and I wonder if you could speak on that. Yeah, so uh, recently, uh, a Minnesota magazine uh, publishes the most hundred, the hundred most influential uh, healthcare executives in in the in the uh, in, in Minnesota, and we had uh, three VA physicians, and I maybe I can just mention Dr. Kent Crosley, who's our chief of staff at the Minneapolis VA, Dr. Hannah Bloomfeld on our staff, who is our chief uh, assistant chief of staff for research, and then Dr. Susan Markstrom, who is the chief of staff at St. Cloud, were all recognized as one of the 100 most influential uh, healthcare. Uh, executives in the, in the state of Minnesota. I know them all three very well. Terrific physicians, terrific leaders, and, and uh, you know, Minneapolis St. Paul Magazine recognizes uh, the top docs in the state of Minnesota. Many of our doctors are in there. Same thing is true with our nurses. So, uh, I mean, I think our veterans can be comfortable and assured that we have some of the top docs in the state, in, the, in, the, in Minnesota, in the metro area, and that they're gonna get good health care at the VA. And, and that speaks to quality that that is one of the uh, cornerstones of the VA system, especially in, in, in I know uh, your facility has been rated very highly, uh, and I believe you've re received some ratings that no other VA healthcare facilities mm -hmm. have. Yeah, thank you for uh, mentioning that. So there, there is a report that the VA puts out every quarter comparing the 160 VA medical centers across a, a large basket of measures to include satisfaction, quality, uh, best place to work, a number of things rolled into a single quality measures. And, and this, you, you, you are rated from a one star to a five star, star facility. We are the one facility in the VA who's been rated five star from the very beginning since 2010. So it's something we're very proud of. Uh, and again, it's not, it's, just, it's not just clinical work, but it's, it's a staff satisfaction, it's veteran satisfaction, it's best place to work type ratings. And so we are, we are very proud of that. And we, uh, we, we are gonna continue that five-star rating because it's something that's, uh, that signals that the quality of care that you get in Minneapolis is second to none. And it's not a blip, it's been an ongoing it's thing. It's been for six years now. Very good, Right. excellent. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I know looking ahead of the future that, you, you know, you serve the, the veterans that, that are coming to you now, but as an institution you need to prepare yourself for the changes we're seeing, you know, our World War II and Korean vets age out and you're seeing a growth in the number of female vets and right. you've got generationally you've got veterans that are maybe more adaptable to technology. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can speak a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, so, so great point. So 6% of our veterans now, uh, about 7,000 of our veterans are, are, are women veterans. And, and so we are opening a new women's health clinic in the next year which will provide additional privacy and, and, and a larger space and expanded services. So we, we now do, and, and two years ago we opened a big breast imaging center where we do a lot of, uh, we do our own mammograms and, and surgeries as needed for, for women veterans. Um, and women veterans need to know that for care that we can't provide in the VA, so we don't deliver babies yet and we, we don't do uh, some women's services we will buy those services for the women veterans who are enrolled with us. And so if a woman veteran becomes pregnant, uh, we will follow her up to a certain point and then do a handoff to a provider in the community and, and who, where they will deliver their baby at, at the VA's expense. And then they can come back and get their health care back with the VA. We don't do uh, pediatrics, so we won't do their, their baby or their child or their infant, but we will do the sort of the broad array of women's health services. For our other younger veterans uh, who are more uh, skilled and adept at uh, 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 technology than, than, than certainly someone of my age, uh, uh, we now, there will be an, uh, at the end of this year, by the end of this year, there will be an app, uh, on, an online app uh, for scheduling. So as it is now, a, a veteran would call the call center, or they would see their primary care clinic, get a scheduled appointment. We don't have an online capability for veterans to schedule their appointment. So by the end of the year, uh, veterans will be able to, uh, it, it is planned, that veterans will be able to use this app on their phone and schedule a primary care appointment at the medical center without calling, without showing up, they just do it online. That's the start. I mean, and again, I, it's recognized that we need to make our services more available uh, in the way that people, especially younger veterans, are accustomed to getting their services uh, through apps online 24-7. Uh, more and more. So, we're, we're, so that, yeah. that saves the veterans time yeah. and it also saves your staff time yeah. because there was the you know expense of if you had to call to make an appointment uh, that was not as, an, as efficient yeah. and those resources can be uh, put someplace else to address health needs. Absolutely true. So we, uh, we, we have a nurse triage call center, we have a scheduling call center, and we have a pharmacy call center you know, for clinical needs, veterans will still need to get in touch with some live person to speak to. But for, for scheduling, I see more and more we will be allowing scheduling online. And, uh, and that's just an enhancement that, you know, other uh, world-class customer service organizations are doing. Uh, that's where we're going. And, and, and it's, it's, uh, it's what people should expect and, sh and, and are accustomed to. Very yeah. good. Well, in our last half minute or so, uh, uh, what thought would you like to leave uh, uh, for our audience to consider? Well, we are, we are working our very hardest to restore veterans' trust in VA health care. Our main initiative this next year will be to um, work on restoring veterans' trust and, and improving the veterans' experience of their health care. We hear all the time that quality is good, they like their doctor, they like their nurse. We want to improve their experience. Easier to call, easier to park quicker to get their services. So, so that's where our effort will be in the next year. And I hope, I hope veterans notice a difference because it, it is, it's about veterans. Uh, uh, we are anxious to improve our services so that we'll, they will more and more recognize and choose us to be their source of health care. Very good. And Patrick, I want to thank you for thank being you, our guest uh, today. Yep. And I want to thank you for the work you and your health care professionals do to make the lives of veterans better. Thank you. And uh, for America Salutes, I'm Milton Schoen, and I want to thank you for watching our program. Good day. <laughs>